Okay, so yeah, we'll bring on next presenters. Uh, it's actually a trio um, from Adelaide, or Flinders University in Adelaide. Uh, so that's yeah, Chris Barry, Helen Harrison, and Vula Gaganis. So uh, bear with us while we promote three attendees. All right. All right, can you see that? Yep, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Helen Harrison and I'm going to be presenting with Dr. Chris Barry and Dr. Vula Gaganis. So we are all um, teaching specialists within the College of Medicine and Public Health at Flinders University. And we're going to be talking about some of the ways that we have utilised LT throughout the year. So first I do just want to acknowledge that we, the three of us here at Bedford Park um, on the outskirts of Adelaide are presenting on the lands of the Ghana people and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So as I said, we're actually going to be talking about three different ways that we've all utilised LT this semester or this year. Um, and I'm going to start off just really talking about quite a standard way of utilising LT. So using it as a platform to enable us to be able to do physiology practicals um, using Power Labs with our students in our labs. Well, that was the plan. So our plan for this year, for this first semester, was really to take a quite large cohort of undergraduate students in first semester in a human physiology topic that's coordinated by Vola through a number of different practicals, um, as I said, utilising LT, utilising Power Labs, and then to be able to expect, extend on these practicals, to build on these practicals in a second semester topic, an integrative human physiology topic that I coordinate in semester two. Um, so these were the first time that we'd actually run these practicals this year. So a lot of preparation had gone into it, a lot of preparation in terms of um, making sure it aligned with the curriculum, making sure we scaffolded appropriately between the two different semesters. Um, but of course, after all that preparation, um, at the end of the first day of doing practical one in their first semester topic, we received an email saying we had 24 hours notice to transition all of our teaching onto online teaching, which I'm sure is probably a similar situation that a lot of people face throughout this year. So that did disrupt that plan. And instead we had to quite rapidly after our initial panic transition those practicals to online practicals. And we did toss up whether we just try and defer the practicals to do it at a different time, but we discovered that it was quite easy to be able to utilize LT to turn these practicals into online practicals. And we did that by um, modifying them slightly, but allowing students to be able to access um, that example data so they could still do some data analysis and see how that all worked. So what we did learn from transitioning to online was that we did require online facilitators still. So we needed people real time available for the students to be able to ask questions um, while they were doing the practice, particularly around those data analysis steps. They weren't quite sure or quite confident in how they could utilise LT to be able to do that without having somebody walk them through it. Um, we did have a few academic integrity issues. So we found that with the students doing these practicals individually at home, that they would um, often um, Google and just copy and paste. So some of the time it was just poor paraphrasing. In fact, I would say the majority of the time it was poor paraphrasing, but occasionally we would see some, um, where we did use the more standard LT questions, we'd see some of those example answers being presented by the students. So they were finding them somehow, somewhere online and being able to put them into their answers as well. The biggest issue that we identified quite early on is that context really matters. And so the students, while they were able to read that really detailed procedure on how to go about doing the practical, they actually were losing some of the context of that and they weren't quite understanding certain aspects of the prac. So the solution to that, to building this context, was um, to provide videos for the students having our facilitators actually walking the students through the practical and seeing how the procedure was performed. And this really benefited the students in that it allowed them to really understand how that data was obtained and why they were analysing it in the way that they were analysing it. And then it enabled them to be able to answer the questions around that data a lot more clearly as well. So you can see this video here. This is one of our facilitators just going through the procedure of spirometry during one of our respiratory pracs. There we go. Um, then after all that work transitioning to online, um, we, we did discover that it actually was a good alternative. The students did really enjoy it. They still got a lot out of it. They had opportunities for that experiential learning where they were able to apply their knowledge. Um, 
But once we moved to semester two here in Adelaide, we were actually fortunate enough to return back to face-to-face -face teaching as long as we fo followed um, COVID safe practices. So that meant we had to reduce our class sizes. So we did have to do more um, uh, options of that particular prac with just less students in them each time. Um, and our lab manager worked really hard to make sure that our lab was COVID safe. So you can see here, we've got these tubs of um, green disinfectant wipes on the bench. We had a whole heap of hand sanitizer. The chairs were marked with these red um, bits of tape so that students would sit 1.5 metres apart. So we really worked hard so that this could be successful and, and we were able to continue on with them. What um, this transition from having to have do online cracks in semester one and then being able to do them face to face in semester two. So the semester one topic, not all of the students who have done that topic come into semester two, but it is a prerequisite for semester two. So the semester two students had all had that experience of doing online cracks. And what we discovered with returning face to face was that the student preference was very much in doing these practicals in person compared to online. I did still have some students who were interstate or into national and so I did have to do a hybrid of um, some students doing it online some students doing it in person but those that had done it in person really enjoyed that experience and the benefits that we did see was that obviously now they could have group discussions so we initially at the start of the year had thought we would put these these groups into groups of three but instead we had them in pairs but by having them together and working through it together obviously that created opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning um, and cooperative learning as well and that enabled me to really pose some quite tricky questions to the students, some extension questions or challenge questions where they really had to problem solve and work through it together. But from our point of view as educators, it was fantastic seeing them discuss, hearing the noise in the room and actually being able to, to get them back, uh, back in person learning. Another real benefit of, of the students doing these practicals in person was that they actually had the opportunity to see what imperfect data looked like. So instead of this perfect example data, they were actually having to predict what good data looked like. They were having to troubleshoot if they weren't getting the sort of data they expected. And they were seeing that sometimes getting data is not as easy as what it, as what it sounds that it should be. It also allowed them to be able to see this inter-individual variability. So they were able to gain a real appreciation between the differences in physiological parameters between different individuals within the class. Um, and I already touched on it, but really the students felt that their sense of understanding of the practical work and of the associated lecture content really increased. And they also um, all reported on enjoying the, um, these practicals in person far more compared to the online alternative. Um, the exams next week, so we'll see, we'll see just how much it's actually benefited them. But I'm gonna now pass over to Chris. Okay, hi everyone. I'm uh, Christine Barry and I'm a lecturer in anatomy here. And one of the things we wanted to do for our students this year in second year medicine was improve the pelvic anatomy content. So uh, pelvic anatomy is an area that uh, medical students and junior doctors report finding particularly challenging. Um, and it's an area where um, junior clinicians feel quite underconfident. So we wanted to improve the students' anatomy knowledge and also their confidence in their anatomy knowledge. And we thought about what makes uh, pelvic anatomy harder to learn compared to say musculoskeletal anatomy. And thinking about what is essential for anatomy learning, there's the um, language learning that's required and there's the visuospatial learning. And we realised that with pelvic anatomy, the opportunities for visuospatial learning are a bit diminished, particularly um, regarding female reproductive anatomy. And we observed in our own lab that the rate of hysterectomy amongst body donors was extremely high. So very few of our medical students had an opportunity to dissect female pelvic organs. And then when um, we have lots of great um, uh, pots, potted specimens in our lab, but we realized that the, uh, you know, the uterus and the fallopian tubes and the ovaries tended to be displayed in a bit of a simplified arrangement compared to the quite convoluted complex arrangement of the, organized, uh, of the organs in situ. So we thought, okay, how can we give students a better appreciation of this? And also that sense of motor learning that happens when students can manipulate specimens and reflect on qu clinical questions while they're actually handling the material. How can we give the students some kind of sense of motor learning in relation to these um, organs? So 
we've got in our lab an anatomage table, which is a, it's a virtual dissection table, but what it's got is uh, uh, images from four bodies, a two, two female, two male, with everything in situ as it, as it was when the person um, died, who was the donor whose um, Im images are stored in the uh, table. So we took um, the uh, images uh, from that uh, table, made some videos and from different perspectives, uploaded the videos into LT and made a module that stepped the students through making um, at scale uh, Play-Doh or plasticine models of pelvic organs, female pelvic organs. So we planned this as an in-lab activity with 30 kilos of plasticine, which is still sitting in our lab because a few days before this prac was meant to be uh, held uh, in late March, we had to go to online learning. But we found LT absolutely beautiful to be able to quickly adapt it for something students could do from home. I got in a little YouTube video of making homemade uh, Play-Doh and embedded in, in there the night before the prac. And um, we, um, uh, the students did it online at the same time. So they all did it at the scheduled um, prac time together. So this is uh, some of the images from the anatomage table. This is what the setup looked like in LT, just really step by step making, uh, stepping them through making these models. That's the uterus and some uh, ligaments and the ovaries there, bladder. And it was, it was really interesting. It looked, seemed so simple. And as the students stepped through it, it seemed so simple. And then they found that they're suddenly able to answer quite complicated questions that um, with normal laboratory uh, specimens, they could find a lot more difficult to, to answer. So things like the drag and drop and um, short answer test qu text questions in um, uh, LT were really handy, really useful. And um, students made their models and uploaded them to, to LT. So here's uh, the standard model that was in the LT platform. Here's a model made by one of the students at home, one of the fellas in uh, second year medicine made this one. Um, and this is, uh, we got them to manipulate their models to answer clinically oriented questions. So on the right, um, we um, got the students to compare an antiverted versus a retroverted uh, uterus. Um, gave them information about only 75% of women have a normal anti-flexed uterus. And um, what does this mean about orientation of the cervix, for example, during a pelvic exam? Um, and the annotation function in LT was fantastic for getting students to practice their uh, language learning as well. Um, here you can see we got them to overlay some glad wrap over their plastic, uh, plasticine model to um, look at peritoneal relationships, what's intraperitoneal, subperitoneal, retroperitoneal. Um, one of our students um, uploaded these images instead of the uh, Play-Doh plasticine. She was um, self-isolating uh, in rural South Australian. She tried to make the Play-Doh and said it failed dismally. So she went down to the creek and got sticks and mud and stones and put together um, some pelvic organs, including uh, the uterus in different positions. And she uploaded images and um, annotated those. Um, and she was a huge fan of the, um, the module. Um, in fact, the 191 students um, gave us feedback and it was 98.5% positive. The students really appreciated this and, and uh, not only because they could do it at home um, in the early days of um, the campus being closed, but also because it did give them that sensor motor um, appreciation of the relationships of um, different um, pelvic organs. Thanks everyone. Um, I'll pass over to Dr. Vulika Gans. Okay, and one button press. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Vula Gaganis, and um, I'm a teaching specialist in human physiology. And I've got the pleasure of um, and privilege of working with these two lovely ladies. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, present to you something that I don't normally present, and um, it's something that came out of, um, I guess, necessity out of what's happening with this year. Um, and it's an unanticipated use of LT. Um, and so I'm gonna report on what I've done this semester, um, considering virtual lab books in one of my topics. 
So um, I used LT for physiology prax in first semester and, um, and that all went really well. As Helen mentioned, we had to flip really quickly and went online. Um, you know, within 24 hours, we were able to run um, our labs um, from, you know, home for people in mainland China, for people interstate. And we we're very fortunate to have our institution um, supply us with licenses that, you know, so we could actually do this. And so having a, a whole semester of um, online prax utilising LT and, and that really made it something that um, you know we were able to continue with. We, we didn't stop our physiology practicals um, and that was I guess the um, underlying um, drive of the, the whole teaching group that we were committed to providing practicals to the students and so we, we were committed and dedicated to having that go on. Now in second semester um, I actually coordinate and I'm still coordinating a semester two topic. It's a skills for laboratory scientists topic and so at the beginning of this semester, one of the main concerns that I had is what if we actually need to go back into lockdown and what am I gonna do with, um, this time I had not 500, but I had 130 students. So it was, it was much more manageable this time around. And so I thought, what was it that actually made the physiology prax accessible to people at home? And it primarily was LT that we were able to, to do, um, continue the prax with. So um, I just toyed with the idea of um, obviously we can't do wet labs and part of the lab skills topic is doing um, Western blotting and doing DNA gels um, and helping the students through genetics problems and things like that. So very hands on, um, a lot of moving parts um, and you know, pretty much it's impossible to do this type of thing at home as you will appreciate. So I just thought, why don't we just um, try and set up a similar scenario to what we did for physiology, but we could use LT as our virtual lab book. So I did look into this a little bit and I did find that our lab notebooks are actually going digital um, in the research world. So this um, was an article that was published in Nature that actually um, encourages people to do so and helps people pick electronic laboratory notebooks. Um, so my curiosity was driven, I guess, out of, you know, what if we went into lockdown, but this is seemed to be something that is um, happening out there in research, but um, has applicability to education as well. So looking further into this, electronic lab notebooks seem to be something that are emerging for people to use um, for labs. And so um, having 130 students who were derived from that initial 500 in semester one, I knew that they would be comfortable using LT. We had the licenses for them and we could pretty much seamlessly move into it. I just needed to set it up. So um, I, I did consider all of the uh, pros and cons and there didn't seem to be too many and I'll go through those a bit later, but it seemed to be um, not a bad thing to do. So um, I went about um, converting their practical uh, laboratory notebook, which we actually have in hard copy and we have it on our learning management system and students, you know, either print it out or if they're people who prefer paperless, um, they actually just bring it on their iPad. Um, and you can see here, this is our second practical, which is a DNA methods practical. And um, I've cut and paste certain bits into LT and um, made some um, tables where students can actually do calculations and, um, you know, ended up being quite a nice, um, you know, a, a decently sized practical for them to go through and be able to utilize LT to put their results and um, generate data tables and whatnot. But the other thing that I found very useful is that it was a single place where I could consolidate not only laboratory methods, but all the instructional videos that we had that went along with these practicals. Um, also uh, linked in lecture notes, um, example calculations, and as I've mentioned, students filled out the tables. So um, at, I, I should also mention that at this stage here in um, South Australia in Adelaide, we were able to have students on campus. So um, we we're allowed to keep um, small classes, lots of repetitions of the classes. And so using LT, um, we're able to have students work in groups for this and log in as groups and be able to, whoops, oh, not a Mac user. Let me just keep going forwards um, and keep um, a track of all the data. So um, before semester started, and it was quite easy to do, um, having to develop um, online practice really quickly in semester one actually helped me develop this pretty um, quickly. 
Um, and um, it, this is just a snapshot of what the report looks like as well. So not only were the methods in there and all of the resources that students needed to complete the practicals, um, but they were also able to submit their um, report this way as well. So in the back of my mind was um, what if at any moment we were told that again in 24 hours you might need to go um, online again. And having this in place um, helped me just have a little bit of um, a safety guard and a safety net in saying that, yes, we can, we can do this successfully. The students know how to use this. They've done it before. Um, and all it would mean for me was, it would be an unfortunate thing, but I would need to provide example data. And, for, and I'm saying unfortunate because for the um, points that Helen mentioned before in terms of supplying perfect data, um, for you know, students um, not being able to you know, troubleshoot problems in the lab, those things would be lost um, if we did have to shift to online. But nevertheless, we had the system there if we needed it. Um, and so that was a blank template. And this is a um, filled out template. So the students have um, literally in the last week submitted this um, assessment and very easily, they're very happy to do so. And, and we run surveys in our groups quite often to see what students actually prefer. Um, and um, students were able to log in, um, put their um, answers into the boxes um, and, um, and I actually have a facilitator who is actually in Tasmania um, who's helping me mark this. So we're able to mark remotely using this system as well. Um, so ease of use was um, a really big thing here. And um, I, I must say, we didn't have too many extension requests um, for this. I think students just look forward to using the platform. Um, now, just finally, I did mention some pros and cons and um, I, in, in having a look at what it was um, that was a pro and a con for having a virtual laboratory notebook, um, there were way more positives than there were negatives. Um, so being paperless and transportable, easy to use, allowing group members access, um, they were able to record, upload and submit their lab reports, um, which are accessible, were able to assess using LT as well. Um, we use a spreadsheet tool and students were able to generate um, graphs as well for their standard curves. Um, it was easy to read for us. Uh, there was no um, laboratory notebook writing to have to decipher. Um, and as mentioned, we were able to um, get students to upload the images and their results using the annotate function, which was quite handy. Um, last but not least, it auto saved to the cloud. So there were no you know, lost, lost data or um, issues with um, having these uh, problems with not having the latest version saved or anything like that. Now in terms of negatives, and I guess this is um, probably gonna resonate with people who use LT for an accessible um, component of their course, is that it, I do um, have concerns about the uh, potential for cheating with um, no turn it in function. Um, so Turnitin is what we use, it's the external tool that we use in our LMS for being able to identify um, similarity between you know, other students' work um, or published, uh, published work. So that's something that I do wish was on there. Um, so we are just going to have to have a keen eye on when we're marking. Um, I do consider that if we were to use these, use LT as a virtual lab book, it is quite expensive because um, you wouldn't necessarily need to have the utility of all the modules and the, you know, the physiology aspects that we currently use for our other topics. Um, it, would, um, it would be um, a lot simpler in terms of what we would need to use it for. And just some simple things in terms of the fact that some people actually prefer writing to have um, an actual um, hard copy of their work. So um, overall, you can see that the um, positives very much outweigh the negatives and the experience of having the virtual lab books in this semester to a uh, topic has not only been um, a pleasure for myself as the coordinator, but for the students as well. Um, and also being something that we were able to um, just have a, a, a backup plan, what if we had to go back into lockdown. We're very fortunate, as I mentioned, that we haven't had to. Um, but um, I think that this is a component of my topic that I will keep for next year because I have seen the positive effects of it. Um, and just to quote um, something that was um, published in Nature um, in that rigor, reproducibility and robustness. And these remind us of the reason why we became scientists in the first place. Um, and, um, and the caption here says uh, quite a lot in terms of the electronic laboratory notebook, providing that missing infrastructure for data recording, retrieval and integrity. Um, so um, that's, that's all I have to present to you on these virtual lab books. Um, and like I said, it was something a little bit different to what I'm, I'm used to doing, which is physiology prax. Um, but hopefully it can, um, you know, maybe other people have done this too. It'd be nice to hear from you. 
um, it, it's just, I guess, nice to share different um, ways of doing things in, um, you know, in topics that have got uh, quite intensive wet labs. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, so we've got a couple of, well, a few questions, if you don't mind answering them. Uh, the first one just from Amanda wondering, uh, Chris, if you're able to share the YouTube URL for the Plastine models. Um, Sure. Um, that, we can sort that outside. Uh, um, can you tell me how to do that? And then I'll <laughs> <very happy>. Sure. <laughs> All right, cool. You'll suss that outside of the event. Um, okay. Then we've also got uh, Steph asking, do you think you would look at incorporating the plasticine anatomy models into other aspects of the anatomy course? Okay, so we're, we're working on a few um, additional models at the moment. Um, male reproductive system is will be the next thing and we're hoping to have that finished in the next six weeks or so. Um, regarding um, musculoskeletal anatomy, which is the main area that I teach in, I certainly thought about that when, when we had to go to um, uh, off campus learning, I, I thought if, if we forced into that situation again, I'll definitely use it um, uh, in musculoskeletal anatomy learning because uh, it lends itself to it very well and you know when, when students can't even handle bones I mean when I was an anatomy student we all bought a box of bones or at least it was on our book list to buy a box of bones <laughs> now then, every week we get people retiring and donating boxes of bones to our lab but um but yeah when students don't have that at home it's just such a huge huge gap and I'm, I'm seeing it this semester when students are coming in for their second semester topic after doing first semester online they're so many gaps. I've just had my first exam results. It's devastating. <laughs> so, so a lot of get a lot of that sense of learning. learning. Uh, yeah, we need to substitute something for it. And and um, LT was a beautiful platform to um, to be able to modify it quickly as as we change to um, on, uh, you know on that uh, online learning. Um, it's a bit of a rambling answer, but yes, I can see the potential for that. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry, just looking at the time, we uh, will try and have Patricia speak again. So, uh, Paramal, Dave, and Amanda, and Elizabeth uh, also ask questions. So, we might just need to address those um, yeah, outside the event. But I just want to say thank you again. Uh, there's a lot of positive comments coming in the chat. So, yeah, cheers. Um, and. Thank you.